while John Carpenter sort of started the teen slasher subgenre craze of horror with Halloween, there's no one who has influenced this subgenre more than the legendary Wes Craven. In his wildly varied and whiplash-inducing career, including a start in the porn industry, of course, moving into the infamous directorial debut of Last House on the Left, stopping to make a quick incest porno for good measure and to get money for a sophomore feature, the horrifying and graphic The Hills Have Eyes. After The Hills Have Eyes, Craven had a bit of a rough patch. His films, while definitely wildly effective for horror fans, were just too disgusting and disturbing for mainstream audiences. I mean, beginning your career with a film in which two women are brutally raped and tortured in the most disturbing and prolonged manner possible, and then following that up with a film in which a family's car breaks down in a territory occupied by uncivilized cannibalistic murderers doesn't exactly scream commercial success for a filmmaker starting in the 70s. However, that didn't stop Wes. He had never been concerned with making others happy. His film career began after he quit on the spot from his humanities professor position in the 60s, after being told to make his lectures more agreeable. So, after this one-two punch, Craven had a bit of a rough patch, directing films that were essentially commercial and critical flops, like 1981's Dead Blessing, 1982's Swamp Thing, 1984's Invitation to Hell, and a rather terrible sequel to The Hills Have Eyes in 1984. Following this rough patch, though, Craven directed the most successful film of his early career and changed the teen slasher subgenre forever with 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street. This film really and truly is what put Craven on the map outside of his niche audience that he had garnered before this film. It introduces a slasher icon in Freddy Krueger, who is arguably the most recognizable slasher villain this side of Michael Myers. It blended dream sequences, suspense, dark comedy, core, horror, and teen high school drama in a way that audiences had never really seen before. This runaway success of A Nightmare on Elm Street would end up being the best thing to ever happen to Craven, and almost the worst thing to ever happen to Craven. Although he thoroughly enjoyed being a horror director, the runaway success of the film had the major risk of pigeonholing him into the despicable Weinstein era of horrendous slasher sequels until the day he died. Thankfully, Craven avoided this, and other directors had the opportunity of making horrendously diabolical Freddy and Freddy vs. Jason studio bullshit. While these sequels were being made, Craven continued his hobby of making absolutely oddball mixes of horror comedies, Cronenberg-esque films, and funnily enough, a 50-minute Disney Channel original with 1986's Case Busters. After a three-year break following The People Under the Stairs, Craven would return to the world of Freddy Krueger with 1994's Wes Craven's New Nightmare. However, this was not Craven's return to the teen slasher exactly. It was the beginning, a stepping stone of sorts, of Craven's new spin on the horror genre, crafting genius mixes of satire, metacomedy, and horror. In the film, instead of being the comical character that Freddy had been turned into in the five sequels following Wes's original, he was the menacing character that Craven had intended him to be. He also was not Freddy exactly, but a demon inhabiting the actor playing Freddy sent to haunt the cast of the original film during the filming. Yeah, it was a big middle finger to all the sequels that followed the 1984 original and a love letter to that original all the same. More than anything, however, as mentioned before, New Nightmare was a stepping stone to Craven's magnum opus swan song, The Scream franchise. These meta-horror comedies perfectly encompass Craven's entire filmography, mixing horror, comedy, and commentary on the teen slasher genre seamlessly. The films thrive on subverting expectations. Huge star Drew Barrymore was actually marketed as the main protagonist of the first film, but was, funnily enough, the opening kill in the film. They have commentary on sequels in Scream 2, the Hollywood studio system with Scream 3, and popularity culture in an internet age with Craven's final swan song, Scream 4. Craven was a director who had an impact on the horror genre comparable to no other. He thrived on subverting expectations, was heavily against director pigeonholing and studio censorship, all the while making some of my favorite films of all time in any genre. He is greatly missed by me and millions of other people, and had one of the most inspiring and eclectic careers of all time.